song book, turn to page number 435. We'll sing the song the choir was just singing. Since Jesus came into my heart, page number 435. There should be a song book in front of you on the pew. Page 435. We'll sing the first, the third, and the last. What a wonderful change in my life has been brought since Jesus came into my heart. I have mind in my soul. Sins can be forgiven 
Lord, we know that we can be saved and saved for eternity. And Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon everything that's said and done in your house today. Thank you for our choir and having the opportunity to get them back up here and singing again. Lord, thank you for the new families, Lord, that are a part of our church, those that are visiting with us here today as well. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for the blessings in our life. And we ask your uh, hand to be upon our service today. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
us and picked up a few uh, new choir members along the way. Thank you for that. And if you're interested in being a part of our choir, see myself, Brother Joe, and uh, about that, we'll give you some information on uh, how you can be a part of the choir. I love good music at church. It prepares our heart. It speaks to our hearts and uh, thankful for it. Get your songbook. Let's stand together, sing song number 12. He touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Song number 12. Think about the word of this great song.
four or twenty three of them so called and no one ever cared for me like Jesus. hospital into a rehab facility where they're helping him with some physical therapy and uh, just be in prayer for him things have been uh, slow we've seen a lot of good progress but things are uh, slow and I know he certainly uh, wants your prayers and he's thankful uh, for those prayers uh, this Saturday is going to be our youth rally uh, here at our church there'll be uh, churches participating in it from uh, all across the, the Metroplex area here in Texas. And uh, so we want all the young people to come and be a part of that. Brother Abdel Judah will be preaching for us on Saturday. And then he's going to be preaching for us in all of our services next Sunday. And I couldn't be more excited if I had my choice of one person in the world that I would like for you all to meet and hear. I would like for everybody to get the opportunity to meet Brother Abdel Judah You'll be blessed by his message. You'll be blessed by his testimony. And uh, we're going to have a good time in church next, uh, next weekend. So you'll be in prayer about that if you would. And then we're going to have our trunk or treat this year. It's going to be on October 30. That's a Friday night. And then we're going to do it in our church parking lot. And so if you want to go ahead and start making plans and preparations for that, it'll be a lot of fun. Everything this year has been one cancellation after another, after another, after another. Cancel, cancel, cancel. And uh, but uh, we're praying that we can just go right on ahead with a few things, amen. And I know it'll be a blessing to our community and give folks a good alternative to uh, the Halloween and all of that. So uh, keep some of that in mind if you would. Also, if you want to give, the offering uh, bucket will be right outside the back doors as you leave church today. And then if you want to give online, there's some instructions about that in your bulletin, how you can uh, not only give through our church website, but you can also very easily text to give, and that's really a simple solution there for you if you want to learn about that. Uh, some have even set up <coughs> recurring giving for things like mission fund or the building fund, and you can do all that right there through our website. We're going to be in 1 Samuel <laughs> chapter number 4, 1 Samuel chapter number 4 right after the special.
morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 4. And we're going to be again picking up on the story in uh, verse number 12. 1 Samuel chapter 4 in verse 12. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon the seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the men came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is done there, my son? The messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath also been a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off his seat backward by the 
uh, side of the gate and his neck break and he died for he was an old man and heavy and he had, ju- uh, and he had judged Israel 40 years. Listen to verse number 19. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself in travail, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her, de- uh, of her death, the woman that stood uh, by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. Heavenly Father, uh, use this message, use this story, these truths as we examine the glory of God and Lord, how we can reflect it in our lives. Lord, we know... Lord, that you are altogether holy, you're altogether wonderful, and you're altogether full of glory. There is nothing that any of us can do to add to your glory. But Lord, I pray today that you would help us to realize the importance of us reflecting your glory. And Lord, I pray that you would bless the message as it's preached today. Thank you for these that are here. Touch our hearts, Lord, as only you can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The glory of God is used to describe God's favor and His blessing towards His people. In the Old Testament, God's glory is seen as the pillar of fire and cloud that followed the Israelites in their exodus from Egypt into the Promised Land. It guided them and it guarded them. It was the glory of God. Later on, God commanded them to build the Ark of the Covenant. And they placed that ark inside the tabernacle in the wilderness. And God's glory resided there with that ark as a symbol of His presence among His people. That ark was so important to them. Uh, You read accounts of when the children of Israel are uh, getting ready to cross into the promised land and they have to cross the mighty river Jordan and the Bible said that it was overflowing its bank that time of year the Bible says that as they carried the ark when the feet of the priests that bear the ark touched the brim of the water the water was driven back in the Jordan it was parted just like the Red Sea was and they walked through on dry ground Uh, The Bible tells us the many stories of how when they would go out to battle, how the ark would go with them and God would always give them victory. It was His presence in the midst of His people. You might remember the story of a man named Obed-Edom who for a while the ark of God was hidden at his house. And the Bible says because the ark was in his home, everything he had began to prosper and began to flourish. And he began to realize that God was blessing him for the ark's sake. He was not an Israelite. He was a man from the same city that uh, Goliath was from, actually. This was a Philistine man. But when he had gotten into the presence of God, when they brought it back to Israel, he says, I'm going with it. Wherever the ark goes, I'm going. I want to be near its presence. So the ark was this most sacred piece of furniture in Israel because God's presence was with the ark. And in this passage that we just read, such a sad, sad story Eli is the priest. He has uh, worshipped and served God in the temple for those 40 years. But as he gets old, he gets not only physically blind, but he gets very spiritually blind to things that are happening in Israel and sin and idolatry and all of these things are entering in. And even his own two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they worked in the temple, but the Bible says they made themselves vile. They were having all kind of lewd and adulterous relationships right there at the gates of the temple. Uh, they're stealing money. And the Bible said the sad thing was that Eli would not do anything to stop these boys. He would not restrain them. And so you might recall the young boy Samuel that is brought there to live. And God gives Samuel uh, uh, this vision. He says, you need to go tell the prophet Eli that judgment is coming to the house of God and judgment's coming to his family. And I'm going to judge his boys for what is done. Battle takes place with the Philistines. Men are being slaughtered on the battlefield. The Philistines are going to take the day. 
And in that battle, those two boys are killed, Hophni and Phinehas. The messenger comes back to Eli, and Eli says, I hear the people crying, what has happened? And they said, your two sons are dead, the battle is lost. But the worst thing of all, the ark of God, the ark of God has been taken to the Philistines. The enemy has it. And when he heard the news about the ark, the Bible says that he was so shocked that he fell over backwards out of his chair and the great fall that he had broke his neck and he died. And then we're told about his daughter-in-law. She's in labor, no doubt, because of the stress of that day in the war and the battle and the commotion. And as she's in labor, her life is, is being threatened. The baby is born. She hears that her husband is dead, that her father-in-law is dead. But when she hears that the ark of God is taken, she says, name the child Ichabod. The glory of God has departed from Israel. The glory has departed. Well, what a sad day. What a sad day when the glory of God has departed and his presence no longer is felt. Now, folks, the glory of God is something that's not all that easy to describe. We talk about it a lot at church. We sing about it. But the glory of God, if you look up the word glory in the Hebrew, you find it's the word kabod. Kabod, which means weight. In other words, it's talking about the substance of something. In Israel, when that ark was in the midst of the people, there was a very real presence that people could feel. It was substantive. They knew that God dwelt among them. They knew that God walked among them. And it was so real and it was so obvious that God was in their midst that when the old preacher Eli heard that the ark had been taken, he had two sons that died, but it was the news that the ark had been taken that caused him to fall from his chair and die. And when his daughter-in-law heard that her husband is dead, no doubt that made her sad. But when she heard that the ark was taken, she lost all hope. And she said, Ichabod, the glory of God has departed. And folks, let me just emphasize this morning on how important the glory of God in our lives really is. And the glory of God in our church really is. Uh, somebody that's visited our church lately, I don't want to mention their name to embarrass them this morning, but they, they told me, they said, listen, I, I, two years ago I visited this church and I felt the presence of God in this place. And for two years, I've been praying about whether the Lord would have me come here. And when I came and visited for the first time, I felt it again, the presence of God. Let me tell you, there's no greater compliment in all the world that can be said about any church than for somebody to say, I feel God in that place. And by the grace of God, may we always be able to say at Crossroads Baptist Church, may we not get too proud, may we not get too high-minded and think that we're doing something right because of who we are or what we have. No, by the grace of God, may people always be able to say, the presence of God can be felt in that place. Because, folks, I've been on places all around the country and to experience the loss of the glory and presence of God is a very sad thing. And I've been to churches who once used to be the greatest churches in the world. Churches with tens of thousands of people and their pastor's names. Everybody knew who they were. Some of the most famous messages were preached in those churches. And now you go back and visit them and they're nothing but empty shells and abandoned buildings and rotting down facilities because the glory has departed from there. I can tell you stories of Christians who used to be in love with God. Christians who sang like you sang. Christians who loved their Bible like you loved their Bible. And I have no reason to doubt the sincerity of their faith. But somewhere down the road they lost their love of God. And they lost their love of His Word. And now they wonder, where has it gone? The glory. I told this story just a few weeks ago, but it, the Lord's brought it back to my mind. I'll mention it again. A preacher told me about... Uh, uh, a visit that he had with a man that at one time was a very well-known preacher and he got wrapped up in a very liberal uh, seminary began to doubt the authority of the Word of God the authenticity of the Word of God 
and actually begin to slowly become a skeptic and then turn into a full-blown atheist and begin to write books against Christianity. And for years, he'd get on the radio and on his program, and he'd attack Christians and preachers. And this one man, even though he had turned atheist, had prayed for him all of those years, had never stopped loving him and trying to be kind to him. And towards the end of his life, as he's laying there in that hospital bed, he calls the preacher, his preacher friend that he had known for all those years, to come and meet with him. All these years, he'd walked away from God. All of these years without the presence of God felt in his life. All these years without being near the glory that he used to have back in those days. And that preacher asked him, he said, why did you bring me here? What did you want to talk to me about? What, t tell me, do, do you have any regrets? And the man just said this, all I can tell you is, I miss it. I miss God. I miss God. Let me remind you of something this morning, friend, that you may try to run from God and you may decide to run from his presence and you may decide to get out of church and you may decide you don't need God's word anymore but I promise you this when you do you will miss it there is something incredibly sad about when the glory of God departs and I'm not talking about somebody losing their salvation I don't believe that for one minute I believe that we're saved and we're eternally secure and safe but I'm telling you the presence of God the glory of God You'll miss it in your life. When we think about God's glory, it's really hard to, to think about something as holy as God when we think about how dark society has gotten. I mentioned that the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word uh, for glory was kabod, which meant the weight or the substance but when you look up the, the word in the Greek, which our New Testament was written in, it's the Greek word doxa. And it's talking about brightness, and it's talking about luster, and it's talking about splendor. That's the glory of God. Why was it that Isaiah had to cover his eyes? Because Isaiah saw the holiness of God for the first time. And when he saw the glorious of God and how good God was and how righteous and pure... He looked at his own wicked heart and he says, woe, him, woe is me for I am undone. What was it that God said to Moses? He says, Moses, I want you to meet me up on the mountain and my glory is going to pass by, but you're not going to be able to see my face and still live. Instead, I want you to hide behind the rock. And God pretty much says in essence to him, you will not see my face, but you'll see my, the after effects of my presence. Not necessarily the back of God, but but, but as I have passed by, you will know that I have been there. And I'm telling you what, when God's presence shows up, whether it's in a church service or whether it's whenever you're praying by somebody in a, in a hospital bed or leading a soul to Christ in the living room of their home, I'm telling you, you can always know when the presence of God has been there. It can be felt. And the Bible talks about that luminosity in God's glory. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 27, give you another example. Uh, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, There are some standing here that shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And we wonder, what does that mean? But then the next verse uh, tells us what he was talking about. They go up on top of what we call the mountain of transfiguration. And there these men see something that they will never forget. They see the kingdom of heaven coming down in a miniature. They see Jesus transfigured into this brightness. And they see two men standing there talking with Christ. Two men that had been dead and gone for years. One of these men was taken up in a chariot of fire, did not see death. His name was Elijah. The other man was the only person God ever personally buried himself. It was Moses. These two men who had been gone for centuries. And yet this is the amazing thing to me, Brother Tim. You would think that those two men standing on top of the mountain of transfiguration... If they were looking at these two men, Moses, you think they would have said, wow, that's Moses. That's incredible. I've always wondered what Moses looks like, and there he is. 
And there's Elijah, that great prophet. I cannot believe that we are looking at these two men, but that's not what was happening. The Bible tells us that those two men were so transfixed with the glory of Jesus Christ. It was the glory of God that had them spellbound. It was the glory of God that left them there with their mouth gaping wide open. And I'm telling you so, something. They had seen the kingdom in a way that they had never seen it before. And you say, Brother, Brother Randy, I don't understand. Why are you telling us all this about the glory of God? What does any of this have to do with me? Here's the point. You and I, we have been put here on this earth. We have been saved from our sin. We have Jesus Christ living in our heart for one reason, and that is so that our life might reflect that glory of God. That's why the Bible says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. All of creation. All of creation speaks of the glory of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, where the Lord appears to Isaiah in the temple, the Bible says that the place fills with smoke. The Bible says that the train, the train, you know what the train is that kings would wear, that long train that would follow him. The Bible said his train filled the temple. In ancient days, if you were a king over many kingdoms, the more kingdoms you ruled over, the longer your train would be. You ruled over two or three kingdoms, your, your, your train would be two or three times longer. Whenever Isaiah saw the king of kings, the Bible said his train filled the temple. Why? Because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. One of these days, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says when he spoke, the, the very post of the door moved at the sound of his voice and there were these seraphims and cherubims and what were they saying holy 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 the earth is filled with his and you would think they would say holiness that's not what it says the earth is filled with his glory his glory the heavens declare the glory of God the firmament showeth his handiwork Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Everywhere you go on this planet, everywhere you look in creation, is the voice of God, and even the heavens declare His glory. Right. You remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and everybody was shouting and saying, Hosanna, and those Pharisees said, I don't think this is appropriate. What did Jesus said? If these people held their peace, even the rocks would cry out. <sighs> All of creation reflects the glory of God. That's why on Christmas Eve, 1968, when the crew of Apollo 8 orbited around the dark side of the moon, were the first to, to, to look back at our planet and see the earth rising up from the surface of the moon. All of those years and all of mankind's history, we have always seen the moon rising up. And for the first time, they're looking from the dark side of the moon as they come up over the surface and they see that blue and white ball hanging in space. And they had no words to describe it other than to say, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Only God could have created something so grand and so magnificent and all of his creation shouts his glory. Think about the contrast, the light and the darkness, the light and the darkness. When a jeweler wants to show you a precious jewel or a diamond, what do they do? They don't just take it out of the cabinet and place that diamond on the glass clear pane, do they? They're going to take that jewel and they're going to pull out a box that's lined with black velvet or dark blue. And they're going to place that gem against the background of that dark color and shine the light on it. And when they turn the light on, something incredible happens. The radiance coming from the outside and the background that is dark from behind, the luminosity in every facet of that diamond begins to shine brilliantly. And as Christians, you and I, our life put against the black, dark, 
backdrop of this world. And folks, we live in a dark world. Everywhere you look, things are getting worse. Things are getting worse. Whether you want to, you, you name any category. Crime, murder, rape, incest. These things are not just crimes that are taboo. These things that are, are, are starting to become mainstream. Hollywood's making mainstream movies out of incest and pedophilia and all the rest of that garbage happening right now in our country. Nobody's bothered by it. There is such a dark backdrop. And as Christians, our, light, our life ought to stick out. It ought to stand out. There ought to be such a stark contrast between what is out there and what is in here. Years ago, Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in that book, he talks about the differences between the dark future predictions of two authors in their books. You might know the first book. It's 1984. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I mention that book? They even made a movie about it. It's the, you know, that, 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 that dark uh, world where everybody's piling up books and burning it and there's all that oppression and all that kind of stuff. The other is by a man named Aldous Huxley, A Brave New World. Postman said this. I'm just going to read his quote to you. He said, what Orwell fear, or feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to a passive, to passive uh, passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared what we would, be, uh, we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared that we would become a trivial culture. As Huxley remarked in A Brave New World Revisited, the several liberties and uh, uh, rationalists who are ever at the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. In 1984, Orwell said, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we fear would ruin us. Huxley feared that what we desire will ruin us. And Postman concluded that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. And friend, I believe that he is right about that. And we live in a time in America today where the pleasure syndrome has taken over and has created a darkness that can be felt in every city, in every town, the oppression that has come over America. And in our pursuit for thrills and ecstasy, we have become a very hollow, a very trivial, a very empty people until all the sacred things of life, things like sexuality and even life itself have been trivialized. And so now our entertainment is just a, a combination of killing and perversion. That's what entertains us now. That's what sells the tickets. And the substance of the real has gone and the hollowness of the trivial has become our new reality. The substance of the real has gone and the hollowness of the trivial has become our new reality. And that's why you have young people in our society that are struggling with suicide and struggling to live at 13 and 14 years of age because they have already felt and tasted and seen that which was reserved only for mature years. And since they have already tasted it and experienced it and felt it and seen it in their teen years, they now are saying, I have nothing to look forward to. And friend, when you have nothing to look forward to, you want to make an exit and leave a hollow existence. And that is where we are at today in America. There is nothing sacred anymore. There is nothing that we hide. There is nothing that we wait for. We want it all now, 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 now. We are driven by pleasure. We are driven by thrills. We are driven by experience. We don't want knowledge. And by the way, it's not just the young. Some of the loneliest people that I've ever met in my life are those who have experienced it the most, those that could afford it the most. It's like being surrounded by all the wealth and entertainment in the world and saying, I'm bored. We are as confused as a culture as we have ever seen in America today. 
And out there you'll not find no answers. Your evolutionist professors, your, your, uh, your humanistic thinkers, the relative minds of the philosophers today, you are not going to find any answers in that. Only more questions in this world is becoming a very dark place. And that is why it is so rare to find that person who knows Christ and Christ brings his light into their life and puts a joy on their face and a brightness in their eyes. And when the glory of God is seen in a Christian who lives against the backdrop of a dark world, that is why it is so appealing and it is so refreshing to be around something that is real in a very plastic and fake world. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Write these statements down. I'll not dwell long on any of them. The, the introduction was already long. But let me give you some thoughts here. How can we reflect the glory of God? First, we reflect God's glory when we care for the needs of others. Our life is to be the embodiment of the gospel message. Folks, we live in a time where there is pain in every pew, heartache in every home, a brokenness on every street. We have got to be willing as God's people to see the need and be there to offer the relief, whether it's just to be a friend or an encouragement or somebody to pray for them or somebody to give in their time of need. We have got to be that in this dark world. I remember reading the book years ago, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. You might know that book. It's a good book to read. And... Uh, but he tells the story of a time where he's on a subway and been busy, was just looking forward to getting on the subway and reading the newspaper. And they stopped to let some passengers on. And when they did, this dad and his two or three kids got on that subway. And he said, those kids were absolutely wild. He said, they were wild. They were disturbing everybody. They were climbing up on seats. They were going around and slapping people's uh, newspapers. He said, I, I, I finally got to the place where I just thought somebody needs to say something to this guy. He's just sitting there like he's oblivious to it. Staring at the ground, blank stare on his face. And he said, finally, I got fed up with it. And I went up to him. I said, sir, don't you think you ought to do something about these kids? He said, the guy kind of looked up at me and focused on my face. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We've just come from the hospital. And my wife, their mother, just passed away a few hours ago. And I don't really know what to think about it. And I guess they don't either. Talk about a paradigm shift. He said, and just that fast, my mind went from being critical, my mind went from being angry, my mind and my tone went from that to, I'm so sorry, what can I do to help? Folks, there are times when we're going to have to be willing as God's people to see the need to have the heart of God. Are you ready to reflect God's glory to somebody this week? God's glory. I read this story this week. I'll just read it to you as, as I read it. This woman writes this. She said, eight years ago, I was standing in the Target checkout line behind a young woman. She had five items, diapers, wipes, formula, bread, milk. When she paid with her debit card, it was denied. She tried again and again, still denied. She walked away. I thought I should pay for her. I wasn't sure, so I allowed her to walk away. I immediately regretted it. It bothered me for the rest of the afternoon when I got home. I told the story to my husband, and even he couldn't understand why I didn't just help her. She said, I was resolved the next time it happened I would pay. So I asked God to give me another opportunity to serve in that way. She said, four years ago, I was standing in the grocery line behind a very pregnant mom holding a toddler propped up on her belly, standing next to a huge mountain of groceries. I heard the mom tell the cashier that her, their fridge and their cabinets were empty and that her boyfriend had just been paid, but when she swiped the debit card, declined. 
She tried again and again, it was still denied. She's flustered. She asked if she could walk outside and call the bank. And as the young mom waddled outside to call the bank, she said, I thanked God for this opportunity and told the cashier that I would pay for her groceries. The cashier seemed uncertain, but I assured her I wanted to do this anonymously. So I paid for the groceries and then mine, and as I pulled out of the parking lot, tears were streaming down my face as I witnessed the groceries being placed in her van, and I sang the song, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. She said, at dinner that night, I told my husband a new story, a story that detailed God's goodness by offering me a second chance. Later that evening, I saw a post on Facebook on one of our neighborhood pages about a mom detailing what had happened to her at the grocery store and how thankful she was for that kind person. And through Facebook, other Christian moms began reaching out to that lady and that woman ended up getting saved, marrying that boyfriend, and now faithfully serves God in the church. I'm just saying, listen, if we're going to make a difference in this dark world, the glory of God is going to have to be reflected through us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Second statement is this, when we share the light of the gospel to those sitting in darkness, we reflect the glory of God. The Bible says in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. It says in verse number 15 that we're not to put our candle under the bushel and hide it. It says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 3, If our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost. Here's the amazing thing about God. God, for reasons that I'll never understand, has entrusted his precious message of the gospel to imperfect sinners like you and me. God is sovereign. God could do anything he wanted. If he wanted to, he could put the gospel in the song of birds. He could write it in the clouds. He could speak in the sound of thunder and lightning, but he doesn't preach the gospel that way. He has given us his treasure in earthen vessels, and we are the ones that he tells us to share, to proclaim his gospel, to tell it to our moms, our dads, our children, our friends, and let other people know that there's hope in the gospel of Christ. Can we remember in 2020, that there is still a literal place called hell that the Bible says burns with fire and brimstone, a place where that rich man in Luke 16 died and went there over 2,000 years ago. And he's been there every day ever since. And he'll be there forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And he'll never have a night of rest. And he'll never have any hope of ever being rescued. And he'll never have a prayer answered. And he'll never have a friend. But every day the blackness and the smoke and every day the worm would die not and every day the cursing and the scream and the gnashing of teeth every day every week every month every year every decade every century every millennia forever and ever and ever and ever and ever that man will be in hell that's what we're up against friend that's why you and I we cannot be shy we cannot be timid we have to tell people about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose for our salvation we have to tell people who will you tell this week who will you tell this week I listened to a story from uh, Ravi Zacharias and he talked about these three old women that he met while he was preaching in India at this home for the poor and the destitute and he walked from room to room, and he said, I was amazed at the twisted bodies and, and, and these people, many of them who had lived on the street, and most of them were forgotten by society and had no friends and had no family. And he says, but while I was there, I met these three women who were orphans who had been raised by Amy Carmichael. How many of you know that name, Amy Carmichael? One of the great, great... Listen, if you want to study a life, if you want to read a biography, read whatever you can read on Amy Carmichael. These women, they wanted to sing a song for him and his wife. And they said, did you ever know Amy Carmichael? He goes, oh, no, I'm too young for that. She, she died before I was born. And she said, we were orphans and Amy Carmichael raised us. We were babies. We were held in Amy Carmichael's 
arms in her home for orphans in southern India. And then they said this. They said, you should have known her. Something I'll never forget about Amy. Her eyes were blue. Her eyes were blue. Robbie said, I went around the country telling that story about Amy Carmichael's blue eyes. And somebody phoned in his office and said, uh, does Robbie not know? Amy Carmichael did not have blue eyes. As a matter of fact, she prayed all her life for blue eyes. Amy Carmichael's eyes were brown. And he says, but that woman, as sure as her existence, as sure as her existence, she knew, she knew that Amy Carmichael and she kept saying, oh, her eyes were so blue. Her eyes were blue. What's the point? The point is this. When you get close enough to people, whether they deserve it or not, whether they're good or bad, whether they're in a hospital bed, in a prison, or that drunkard laying on the side of the road, when you get close enough to minister to people that they can see your eyes, then they know that you can. I'm thankful for a church that likes to help the needy. I'm thankful for a church that supports missionaries that goes and do, does these things in the world. But it's not just enough to send somebody else in our place. God wants us to be a missionary right where we are. Right where we are. Famous missionary to the lepers in the island of Hawaii, Malachi. His name was Joseph Damien. His brother had surrendered to go be a missionary there, and his brother died. And so he decided to take his brother's place, and he went to that leper colony. Can you imagine going to a leper colony as a missionary, knowing at that time there was no cure, there was nothing to be done if you contracted it? And he went and he served those lepers, and he ended up contracting leprosy himself, and he died there. The Belgium government demanded that his body be flown back home because he was a hero. But the people with leprosy begged that his body could be kept there. And finally, they struck a deal in some middle ground. And they said, since he is the son of your soil, we'll send your body back since you want him. But would you please allow us to cut off his right arm and bury it here? Because that's the arm that reached out and touched us. You go to that island in Hawaii today, you still see the grave and the grave marker of that missionary that made an impact on those forgotten people. Christianity has always had a touch. Everything Jesus did as he walked among some of the most unwanted, unlovely people on the planet. You look at the folks that surrounded him. It was not the rich and famous. It was beggars. It was lepers. It was people who stank. It was people that nobody wanted to be around. And yet Jesus got close. He got close. Let's remember that. The last thought is this as we wrap things up this morning. If we are going to reflect the glory of God, then we will have to learn to forgive those who have hurt us. Forgive those who have hurt us. Nothing reflects God's glory more than forgiveness. Because he's forgiving. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 43. Have you heard that it has been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy? But I say unto you love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. It's hard to do isn't it? Hard to do when somebody screaming in your face cursing you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be called the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. If I was God, I wouldn't send rain to the unjust. I'd only send it to the good guys. I wouldn't send it to that evil farmer. I would only send it to the farmer that thought like me and lived like me. But God says that he's good to the just, the unjust, sins, rain, blesses them. And verse number 46, for if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? If you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And 
Folks, we live in a time where this world is full of hate. Hate. And we see neighbors screaming at neighbors, cursing at neighbors. We see people inflamed and enraged over the upcoming election. And people can't even uh, be friends on social media anymore. Families can't even get together for the holidays anymore because everybody is full of rage and anger and hate. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It takes no grace at all to love somebody that loves you back. None. God wants us to love even those people who hate us. Even those people who say terrible things about our faith and our beliefs in, in, in God. God wants us to get to the place where we love like he loves. That's not popular preaching because everybody's so incensed right now. But that's what your Bible says. All right. Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. What are they? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith temperance, which is self-control. Same chapter tells us what the work of the flesh is. Envy. Hatred. Variance. Wrath. I'm just saying we need God's help to reflect God's glory. Let me ask you this question. We're done. You can close up your Bibles. Let me just ask you this sincere question this morning. Have you, have you had a time in your life when you have received that glorious gospel into your life? Do you know that you're saved? Is the light of God in your heart? Do you know that you're a Christian? Do you know that you're his child? Do you know that if you died, you would not go to hell, but you would be pardoned and you would go to heaven? Do you know that? The next question is this. You say, Brother Randy, I'm, I'm saved. I know that I've been saved, but I'll be honest, I feel like the glory has departed from my life. And I just don't enjoy serving God like I used to. I know I haven't lost my salvation, but I feel like Ichabod. I feel like the presence, the glory, the wonder, the splendor has departed from my life. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Thanks for your attention this morning. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed as we think about that, the message. As we think about the backdrop of this dark world in contrast. Just like that diamond sitting on that black velvet case. Just like that earth rise from the dark side of the moon and it looks so bright and blue in the midst of that black void. That's what we're supposed to be. Salt and light. Salt and light. You said, Brother Randy, by the grace of God, I want people to see the glory of God reflected in me. I don't want them to see my glory. I want them to see God's glory reflected in my life. That's my prayer. Would you just lift that hand right up and right back down? God bless you. That's my prayer. This message is not something I preach to you. This is something I preach to me. Say, Brother Randy, I'm saved and I know it. If I die, I know heaven will be my home. It was a time and a place where I obeyed God's word and I believed on the name of the Son of God for salvation. Would you slip that hand up? I'm saved and I know it. I'm saved and I know it. God bless you. Good save, brother. Brother Randy, I didn't raise my hand a moment ago because I just don't know for certain if I died where I'd spend my eternity. Brother Randy, please pray for me. I'd like to be saved. I'd like to settle the matter. I'd like to be able to leave church with that clear, clear conscience, knowing that my sins have been forgiven, knowing that I've obeyed the Lord and I have believed on it name of his son Jesus Christ brother Randy I don't know that I'm saved but I'd like to know you just slip that hand just right up and right back down anyone like that at all I don't know for sure but I'd like to know for sure heads are bowed eyes are closed this morning we're going to 
have a baptism in just a moment. Maybe God's been dealing with you about that. We try to keep the water warm on Sunday, baptismal robes, all of that. You've not been saved. You need to pray about taking that first step of obedience and following the Lord's example in believer's baptism. Maybe it's membership. Maybe it's taking the next step and learning to tithe or giving to missionaries, getting involved in a ministry of the church. What's the next step for you? Maybe God's calling you to be a missionary somewhere in the world, perhaps, in your neighborhood. Absolutely. Father, Lord, I pray that you would bless this time of invitation, help us as we gather around this altar and pray. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us this week to leave with a burning desire in our heart to reflect the glory of God in this dark world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The piano begins to play. Let's find a place to do business with the Lord today. baptism. Brother Joe's going to come lead us in just a couple verses and courses of a song and then we'll enjoy baptism again. Let's grab our hymn books real quick. Turn to page 145. Page 145. We sing, I love to tell the story Jesus and the Lord. Page number 145. I love Yes, sir. 
clap the cross, page number 55. blessing on the congregation that we'd have a good week and return next Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.